Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. I'm going to kick this video off discussing a patent which has been filed by AMD pertaining to GPU chiplets. I think most would agree that chiplets have been AMD's weapon against Intel in CPUs anyway. They haven't employed them yet for GPUs, but both Zen 2 and Zen 3 have scaled wonderfully with chiplets. And of course, this has allowed AMD to roll out, let's say, 64 core Epic processors in servers and 16 core processors in desktop. This has meant that Intel have gone from an extremely dominant position to, well, just kind of playing defense, honestly. But Intel, Nvidia, and AMD will all be embracing chiplets very heavily for their future architectures. Oh, small note. Um, I'm recording this video a little differently than normal. Basically, you might notice I'm not wearing a lapel mic. That's because I did an oopsie in my uh, recording my last video and I broke my lapel mic. I've got a new one incoming, but yeah, at the moment, a mic is just kind of off to the side, so audio quality is probably not going to be great. I'll, you know, hope for the best, though. <laughs> but anyway, getting back to the topic itself. So this patent actually emerged on the 1st of April, but no, it's not a joke patent and bears quite a few similarities to another patent. How many times am I going to say patent in this video? Uh, back in January. There are, however, some pretty major differences between them. And you can see uh, images, of course, throughout um, this video on screen. But yeah, so the patent that we saw earlier uh, this year it essentially was a passive bridge between chiplets. So basically it was there just to facilitate communication. However, this patent is an active bridge chiplet and basically serves as a high bandwidth die-to-die -die interconnect. AMD also add a few other small details. For example, this will operate as a memory crossbar and it will operate uh, as a crossbar with a last level cache or LLC if you prefer. This would essentially mean that you have uh, chiplet synchronization. And AMD also add, another thing too, is that this whole bridge can essentially act as more a monolithic GPU, so you can address it very similarly. This means that you have a lot less concerns about in, um, addressing and managing individual caches, which obviously has numerous benefits for developers, uh, particularly when it comes to optimization. Now, it's important that we put the brakes on the train for a second, you know, let's not go choo-choo too fast, and, you know, just point out the very obvious thing, that a patent is a patent. A patent doesn't necessarily become a product, and also, the thing with patents is that they are pretty ambiguous, so even if this does become a patent, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be uh, employed exactly how it's described here in a, you know, product. And, of course, the other thing is we don't know whether this is for RDNA 3 or whether, for example, RDNA 3 is using the patent that we saw in January or whether this is for an entirely different architecture or a future iteration of RDNA 3. For example, maybe, sorry, for RDNA, maybe this is, for example, RDNA 4. Either way, it's very interesting that we're starting to see this. To my knowledge, Narvo 31 and 32 will both be using two compute dies and a single I.O. die. However, Narve 33 will only have a single die. So yeah, basically up to 160 compute units for the highest end SKUs, and then obviously Narve 33 will use 80 and below, depending on the configuration, just like, of course, we see with other uh, GPUs in the stack. You know, as you kind of go down the tier list, you have fewer numbers of compute units and ray tracing units and whatever else. I think that Narve 31 and 32 and so on are going to be a very tangible improvement in performance over what we have currently, but I also just wonder how all of this is going to be implemented just in a technical sense. It's going to be very interesting to see how the market kind of embraces this, and also what NVIDIA does with Lovelace and the timing of its products. You know, in a recent video I stated that I'm hearing that Lovelace may actually launched quite a bit earlier than RDNA 3. However, the source that told me that seemed a bit a bit unsure. And honestly, I don't think we're going to see any major consumer-facing products. That is a new product line this year. Maybe I'm wrong, but with all of the shortages, it just doesn't seem like that's likely. So I think for RDNA 3, 
yeah, my gut feeling is that we're not going to see it this year at all. It's going to be the second half, and that's what I've been hearing from multiple sources as well. Either way, this is a very cool pattern, and I very much look forward to seeing what this is going to bring to uh, to gamers. Like This is going to be very cool, at least in my opinion. And another thing that's actually really cool is that we're going to see an increased amount of shipments for Ryzen processors. And obviously, this is a very good thing in terms of availability. So Channelgate were the ones who originally broke this news, but they stated that the Ryzen 5000 series processors are going to have that availability increase by around 20% relative to Q1 of this year. Furthermore, the rumor is that yes, AMD basically reduced its uh, manufacturing capacity on its own products, so Zen and uh, RDNA, and this is because the games consoles, the PS5 and Xbox, basically had a much larger allocation of TSMC production capacity. I've, you know, reported on this numerous times, and I do believe that's true. Ultimately, one of the reasons that Sony or Microsoft would go with AMD is obviously, well, at least one of the criteria that Sony or Microsoft would, uh, you know, request of AMD would be a set number of processors to be available. So that would, of course, mean with all of the production, you know, let's say uh, supply constraints that are affecting TSMC, ultimately something had to give and AMD just needed that uh, contract from Sony and Microsoft. So of course the thing that had to give is the own production capacity. The good news is though that, yeah, my suspicion is that if this information is true, and ultimately I can't confirm this at the moment, but I suspect it probably is true that AMD are ramping up Zen uh, production capacity, I suspect it will also start trickling down to other products such as RDNA. And the reason I think that AMD are able to do this isn't because the, let's say, PlayStation 5 production uh, demands are going to be diminishing, it's more that Apple are relinquishing their, their uh, 7 nm capacity and there's been multiple reports at this point that AMD have been gobbling up a ton of 7nm capacity. So obviously this is going to be of paramount importance for AMD going forward. Hopefully, and uh, hopefully is obviously not necessarily a guarantee, but hopefully this will help to alleviate some of the demands in the future anyway for products. I think that CPUs are somewhat in less demand, but just because gamers are so, you know, building new systems and work from home and all of this stuff that we've discussed a dozen times by now, you know, CPUs are still in demand as well. So with additional, uh, you know, capacity, more products in the market, this is only ever a good thing. The final piece of news for today, though, is that the next generation thread ripper parts, which of course will be based on the Zen 3 processor architecture, have a release date. And we're going to see these CPUs allegedly launch in August. Now, it's imperative to realize that this is only a rumor. However, the user that stated this is Yuko Yoshida, and they used to be known as Kitty Corgi. They actually released a ton of information back in the day and that info was actually pretty good. But furthermore, HW Info have also uh, released an update for their software, and it now is able to detect the next generation AMD Threadripper. It says, and I quote, improved detection of AMD Threadripper Pro and next gen Threadripper. There is no information, of course, other than that in their notes. They're not going to detail the core count or anything like that. However, it is a good sign that AMD will release these products. And, of course, they will. Threadrippers typically do launch later than their, you know, desktop counterparts. Ultimately, these are, of course, more for professionals. So it's going to be kind of... Um, Likely that after, you know, we see the Threadripper parts in August, you know, later this year, to my understanding anyway, we're going to see Warhol. But Warhol is probably not going to be anything massive. It's, to my understanding, maybe around 5-6% IPC gain. Some are telling me it's a little bit higher than that, but honestly, I'm erring on the side of caution because I don't think it's a massive departure over what we have with Zen 3. And it's going to have a modest clock frequency bump, so... I'm going to err on the side of caution and say Warhol is probably uh, Ryzen 6000, I guess we can call that. It's probably going to be around 10% like for like faster than the previous part. So, for example, um, let's say the 69, nice, 
50 would probably be around you know 10% faster in highly multi-threaded tasks compared to its predecessor but that is just speculation on my part Chagall is going to be an interesting uh, you know I, I guess uh, weapon in AMD's toolkit because it's not like AMD are really fighting that much at the moment against Intel and HEDT I think it's fair to say that the second you know the Zen 2 based thread rippers you know just it pretty much has left Intel helpless in that market. So I guess in that respect, basically AMD kind of have it all to themselves. And I don't really like that, honestly. You know, I do want uh, Intel to be competitive in these markets because it only helps us as, as end users. But with that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. The normal stuff if you did, like, share, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.